and welcome to the Above the Bar podcast, where each week we belly up to the bar with a new guest, find out what they do, who they are, and what makes them great. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. All righty, folks, welcome back to the Above the Bar podcast. It's your host, Sean. We are bellied up to the bar tonight. We have a lovely young lady who is joining us from from uh, the Big Easy right now. Traveled from, from the Lone Star State to the Big Easy to be with her, be with her Marine and talk to us about uh, what I... You know, my definition that I looked up was uh, how your behavior and your environment can affect your genetics. We're talking epigenetics tonight. And with us, we have Miss Charlie Hagen. Wait a sec, she gets extra. Yeah. She raised a Marine. <laughs> That's right. She raised a Marine. A Marine shirt. She, she gets a Hi, Miss Charlie. How are you? I am fabulous. How can you not be ama- do away amazingly well when you're in New Orleans? Actually, I'm looking at the cathedral from the other side of the river. I'm in yeah. old Algiers. That's my view out my window. There is definitely worse views that you can have. Mm-hmm. My my oldest son um, sent me a message. We were talking today on the phone. He's down in uh, 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 Orlando in uh-huh. school. And he says, Dad, I'm, uh, as soon as this training, the school I'm in is over with, I'm going to go to University of West Florida. I'm like, son, that's Pensacola. He's like, yeah, that's right. I'm like, it's two hours from like in my mind, I was like, Pensacola is amazing, but it's two hours from New Orleans. Yeah, that's true. Um, Yeah, this they go back and forth all the time. I actually have another nephew, also Marine, who's a Blue Angel. So they go. Oh, really? And when they had the air show here in um, at Bell Chase, uh, my son actually got to ride in, in the extra seat in the number four. And Frank is the number four pilot. So, now is that the the picture I saw of your son with with another young man in in a Blue Angels uh, mm-hmm. flight suit? Yep. I, we're gonna get into this because I did twenty years in the Marine Corps, and yeah. my flight suits always were like looked like your son's. They were baggy. Mm-hmm. Mine were a little bit funkier and greasier, and oh. like I was fixing stuff, and they probably smelled like JP five, which is jet fuel, and they were all those kind of things. I was looking at these flight suits and I'm obviously you said that's your nephew. I'm looking at your nephew's flight suit and thinking oh, to myself, they that are thing body is, fitted to those guys. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, that kid doesn't get to eat. He, <laughs> don't. he don't get to eat when he has to put they that don't. thing on. Mm. It's such a huge recruiting tool that a good piece of that is um, you have to, they're close to the same height. Um, you have to have a certain body structure, you know, all those kinds of things because uh, of, you know, part of it's the jet, but uh, Frank likes to say that uh, speaking for all of the military pilots that they don't really do anything up there in the air that mili- military pilots don't do as part of their training. He says, we always want to share that, you know, my other men in arms that are in these jets with me can do the same thing. And they That's do awesome. similar things in the helicopters, just not quite as fast or as high. I, I fix those things. So, mm-hmm. Well, let's do well, our thank housekeeping. You. <laughs> thank you for your service. <laughs> well, thank you for raising Marines. You know, that's yeah, I think yeah, we did. You you get your own award just for that. So, well, let's go ahead and do some ha- quick housekeeping here, folks, so that everybody uh, knows what's going on. As always, over my right shoulder, I fixed the microphone so you can actually see it a little easier. Uh, we got sticker and a cause. If you've got something that you're supporting, some cause, whether it be uh, maybe you've got a veterans group that you're supporting. Maybe you got a little league team. Maybe you got your own podcast. I don't care what it is. Reach out to us on Facebook, the Above the Bar podcast, or our parent network, which is the Earplug Podcast Network, or our LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. All those are the Above the Bar podcast. Even our TikTok is the Above the Bar podcast, and our email, the Above the Bar podcast. Send us out, out a message. Uh, I'll tell you where to send it to, and write me a little note about, hey, this is what we do. This is what this is about. And what we'll do is we'll read that live on the air and we'll put it on the big board for sticker and a cause and everybody can learn about what you got going. So we got that. And then the other thing, maybe your media is looking a little old and ragged and it needs to change its environment and change its mental health. So you need to reach out to media by dibs. Media by dibs is your one-stop shopping 
reach out to Dibs and you tell him hashtag belly up to the bar. He's going to give you a 10% discount on your first order and a free consultation. You can find him on Facebook and uh, Instagram at media by dibs. That's also our, we're also, I always forget that, that our Instagram is the above the bar podcast, but reach out to, to media by dibs and uh, on LinkedIn. If you're looking for him, it's under Andrew Dibble and you let him know and he's going to take care of you and hook you up. So, all right. All right there, Charlie, it's all set and done. We're all good. You got, what do you got? You got whiskey? What are you drinking? Uh, actually, because I'm I'm taking care of some kids, I'm drinking uh, very modestly. This is actually a fever tree with a little bit of a basil infused gin. I mean, basil infused vodka with a lime. And I'm doing I, it very light because I've got um, three eight-year-olds. <laughs> and if you hear catastrophe in the back, <laughs> I told them it's just going to have to wait until eight o'clock. <laughs> wait, wait till it's done. Well, it, are you sure you want to drink lightly with all those kids? I mean, <laughs> I mean... I don't know if that yeah. sounds like a great plan at this point, but you know, I guess we'll go with it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's, let's get in into this. Absolutely. And I, at first I want to start with a little bit of your background. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that aren't, aren't watching this live, uh, and I don't know if Miss Charlie wants to say it, but I promise you, you won't guess her age. I promise you, you won't. Uh, if you're watching live and, and she's welcome to say it if she wants to, a gentleman knows better than to never ask a lady her age and I'm not getting yelled at. So I'm so proud to share how old I am. My, All right. um, my years on this earth are 71, but my body age is 48. Now, how do you figure Now, How does that, because I'm 45 and I feel like my body age is 68. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> well, I'm, I blew out my left knee. So. We definitely need to talk. Now, that's idea. what epigenetics is all about. And there's actually a metabolic tool. There's a couple of different ones that you can use to get your body age. Um, there's one that is surprisingly accurate. It's an Omron scale and it sends all sorts of um, electronic currents through your body and it measures uh, very accurately your weight. It's a much better um, measurement of your weight. Usually it's a little bit heavier than what you're used to. It also uh, measures the amount of fluid that you have, inflammation that goes towards your body age. Um, it computes your your mass, you know, that number that everybody wants, that body mass number. Um, looks at, at how many calories you need just to function on a daily basis. Hmm. And then it gives you this body age number, which, oh, it also gives you, uh, it measures the amount of uh, fatty tissue you have around organs like your heart, your kidney, your liver, which is also a frightening number. And it's amazing. And, and I was in that situation um, when I was uh, 59. I kind of had this catastrophic event and uh, my body age went from uh, 32 to 73. And that was kind of what started me on rearranging what I was doing and looking at things a little bit differently. It kind of came out of nowhere. I've always been about health and wellness and taking care of myself. But uh, having that number show up, fortunately, that number of, about the fatty tissue around the major organs didn't change. So I knew there was hope. But if you don't have that, an idea of your body age, that is so important because it gives you inflammation. And in our environment, inflammation is critical. And I was probably the thinnest I'd ever been. And I was running a marathon. I looked so good on the outside, but that was not a true picture of what was going on the inside. And well, that's, that's why you can't go by what you look like or sometimes even how you feel. Maria, see, that's, that's interesting that, that approach. And, and I wanted to kind of get into this beforehand. So, you know, you're a, you're a busy lady. You've always been, I mean, we, we talked a couple of months back, you know, so <laughs> entry was I in <laughs> right. You know, so well, I'm just thinking like, you've been a school teacher, mm -hmm. you've raised, how many boys did you raise? Uh, actually three girls and a boy. He was the three baby. girls. Right. Three. Okay. So three girls and a boy, one, one of them, the boy being a Marine, we won't hold the fact that he's an officer against him. You know, <laughs> Please don't. We, we, we can't all be perfect. He's an officer that they love. We can't all be perfect and be enlisted. I mean, yeah, true. I mean, it happens, you know, um, and let's see what else it been married for ever. ever. You, you, <laughs> you, you, you like, you, you, you like a good nip here, here and there. We just talked about that. You know, you, and the reason I'm bringing these things up is we're going to talk more about the epigenetics, but a lot of people, when they think about health and well-being, mm -hmm. they think I've, I've got to be just as strict to the numbers. I, if I don't do all these things and then they go, well, I'm not doing that because I'm not going to be healthy that way. And, and they blow it off. 
But I mean, I'm kind of curious, like your early life, you were always a, a health conscious person. We talked about this. You were always an active person. Yes. And I was very fortunate to grow up in Corpus Christi and uh, we ran around, uh, you know, we were in that generation. And But my grandchildren are raised the same way. I mean, the kids right now out here running up and down I and mean, I'm watching them running up the levee to the Mississippi River and back down again. But we were we stayed out till dark and we the baby boomers. I think we had the best of the best. We had the food value of an apple I ate in 1960 when I was nine years old is almost 10 times the nutritional value of an apple you'll eat today. What, what do and you mean by that? The uh, soil has been depleted and um, the there's just not enough, not the same nutrition in the food. And we're putting additives on there. Also, the apple I ate would not have been sitting in a grocery store for a long time. And I didn't have apples year round. It was seasonal. You know, we had apples in the fall. We had oranges at Christmas, you know, a cherry. We were talking about that the other day. I think I was probably a grown woman before I saw an actual fresh raw cherry. They were in cans and a, a lot. It, it seems odd to think about that, but um, we didn't have the the understanding of what we have today. We didn't have the, trans, the same type of transportation system. And my family was all farmers down the Rio Grande Valley. So it was um, that was important. And they were on the cusp of all the things changing so very, very quickly. When you pick produce really early, I can give you a little tip. You know how to tell when an avocado is really perfect when you get it at the store? Well, it's got to have just barely soft. Mm, could that could be, but you look at the little brown tip and uh -huh. you kind of pop it off and it can be a little bit soft. And if it was green, it was picked way too early. So it's been ripening there in the bin. If you pop it off and it's just slightly brown, it's absolutely perfect. If it's I open, see, I didn't know that. Like, my yeah. my daughters are so I have a vegetarian and a vegan daughter. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that. We actually in a couple of weeks we have uh, two ladies coming on that have a food program like to donate food that is all vegan, donating mm -hmm. home food to the homeless all vegan, um, which is I find interesting. But so vegan. you were, I mean you came of that that generation, and it's interesting to hear that you know a generation that. I always say mine was kind of in between bit, you know, 80s, 45. Are you an 80s, are you an 80s? Yeah, I was born in 76. So we, we yeah. kind of had that transi transition. Mm -hmm. Like my, it's funny. You've talked about the, the canned cherries. My dad, when my dad had, he loved asparagus, but would mm -hmm. only eat canned asparagus. And, you know, we had an asparagus tree in our backyard in Corpus. We also had a um, avocado tree, a fig tree, you know, we had all these, those things growing back there, but yeah. I, now, what's I an know asparagus exactly. tree? Cause asparagus grows, it's a grass. What's an asparagus tree? It's, it's vertical. It's like a fruit hanging off of it. Oh, it's that's weird. I've never, tree. yeah. I have to look that yeah, one up. That's a new one for me. We have all the trees down there are massive. They're the size of houses. They're huge. Yeah. That's wild. I mean, it's, it's very, it's very different growing up down there, but nutrition is such a perfect a concept to understand with epigenetics because, and you're talking about it being hard. Yes. Uh, being healthy, being a healthy weight is not easy. It gets easier when it becomes a habit. It's so much easier. Now I was that weird person that was always eating salads and, you know, I, Oh my goodness. I remember the first time, I mean, like I said, my families were farmers and ranchers and I went off to school and I actually had a swim coach who at, at a and I was in the first class of women at a and and I was the a and women's swim team for uh, about a year and a half before they started adding more athletes on there. And we had a coach who said that for what we were doing, that a plant-based diet would actually be better. And so we actually went plant-based. And I, I wouldn't call it vegetarian because we weren't, but we, we went plant-based. He didn't load us up on carbs. And I was a long-distance swimmer. And he didn't load us up on carbs. It was a, a different diet. And it was very successful. When I got there... Um, they took us for the um, evaluative test, you know, to be sure you were healthy. And they found that I actually had a heart murmur. I was really? A couple of weeks early, never knew it. My parents did. It had never slowed me down, anything else. I didn't start swimming competitively until I was a sophomore in high school, originally to get out of a um, PE class. And then there was a Marine who was in Corpus at the Naval Air Station. He was a reservist. It was called up. And he had been the swim coach in Ohio of a couple of Olympic athletes. Oh, wow. And there were three of us on this little team and they're in Corpus Christi, Texas. And he said, 
I can make you three champions if you do everything I ask you to do. So in a way, Sean, I got a Marine boot camp. <laughs> you, 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 got, you got a little bit of Marine upbringing there. I did. I did. I remember one time I had really long hair and he kept telling me I needed to cut it. And my rubber band broke and I was getting out and there was this boot on my forehead. And he said, what are you going to do if it breaks in the middle of a swim meet? He shoved me back in the water. So I swam <laughs> for like an hour and a half with his hair in my face the whole time. Now, I'm, I'm curious now. You went to college what year? Se I guess what would that have been about? 71? 1969. Which 69. was interesting. And this actually does all tie into epigenetics. Um, that was just six months after, you know, some of the worst fighting in Vietnam. And uh, I had to be in a, um, a philosophy class and it was in the same building as military science. And I, I was very much against the Vietnam War, but I was very, very pro-military. I didn't, my dad was through Korea. He was in, he was a, he was a Navy bombardier in World War II and Korea and survived to tell the tale and have four girls. I mean, oh, wow. but his, you know, he did not want another war going through Korea. He just thought we we're going to be in the same thing. Um, so I did not believe that was a war we needed to be in, but I was totally behind our military. And um, I remember standing in line with these seniors there at A&M and when they graduated, they were going off to Vietnam and they knew it, you know, they, they were, they would be second, I mean, second lieutenants. Second lieutenants. Yeah. And they were, they were done. And I remember standing there just a couple of weeks before graduation with some of these guys. And I asked some of them, and we've been standing in line together for a semester waiting to go into class. And I said, can I have your, you know, if I give you my address, will you give me yours when you get where you're going? And they would just, a couple of them sort of got tears in their eyes and said, yeah, because we don't know what we're going into. Oh, yeah. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, for this, the spoiled, rotten baby boomers. And that was a draft war. I mean, they were sort of drafted. You know, they had to go to school and do all that kind of stuff. It was, a lot of people did that to originally get out of the draft and go in as an officer, hoping they'd be in Germany, not Vietnam, you know, that kind of thing. But it wasn't like World War II where everybody was, yes, you know, and they went to war in World War I and World War II. It was very different. And um, just that that atmosphere and to be a part of that atmosphere was very sobering. And I totally believe that my parents' generation was the greatest generation. But I think the baby boomers stepped up and it broke my heart the way we treated our military when they came back from Vietnam. It just it tore me up that that's, you know, that's, that was what happened. And I'm so uh, grateful that we're now recognizing the sacrifices and the bravery and all the things that they did for us that in an unpopular war without the support of their country, they did it because it was the right thing to do and what was expected of them. And my son is now in an all volunteer army. They're all there because they want to be there. And um, I wish my father was here for him to talk to my dad. I remember one time over dinner in 67, when everybody knew what was going to happen, I asked, again, there's several people we knew that were taking their sons to Canada. And I asked my dad, I said, dad, what do you think about wow. it? And he had served in the Pacific. Any, any, my, my um, father-in-law was a Marine on the ground in Iwo Jima, all those battles. My dad was in the air. They used to talk about the two. They were all there a part of that. And dad just without missing a beat, he said, we'd be driving north. And I thought, oh my goodness, if you if you want to know how much that war tore this country apart, you had patriots from World War II saying, no, I don't, I would not want my son doing this. I mean, it was just such a, um, an odd time, you know, to be in all of the, um, the, the stress, you know, the racial tensions, the military tensions, it's very similar right now. Uh, to me, the music of the 80s was also the music of the 60s. And now you're kind of reliving <laughs> the 60s in many ways. And that um, that stress that we were under, um, the constantly being torn between one philosophy and another, and very much like today, it was polarized. If you were a young man with long hair and uh, baggy blue jeans on, you were treated completely differently from someone with short hair and a button down shirt and a pair of slacks. There were a lot of doors that were closed to you just because you had the movie, hair. the outsiders. It's the you movie, guess. the outsiders, the gre greasers and the socias. Yes. 
And we're seeing many of the same things depending on whether you wear blue or red or, you know, there was a lot of conversation that was lost. There was a lot of conversation that happened before. And then I think one of the things we did and one of the reasons I think that we will recover from this is because some of the things that happened, you know, shooting college students Mm -hmm. on a green. I mean, it was just horrific. Um, so many of those things that happened and the animosity towards the police and the drugs and just so much that happened. People were saying, there's no way we'll come back. We're going to be permanently divided. There's no way we'll come back. And yet we did. And we healed it. And we've made, I think, you know, we're the reason we have um, mommy vans and condos. What more could you ask? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, I I don't. I want to talk about the epigenetics, but you you bring up it's a, just part a top, of that stuff. but it's but you bring up a topic that that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I've had this conversation many times, and I always feel funny today when somebody says, "And I, I'd be curious to ask your son. You should ask your son how he feels about this, or when he retires, when somebody says to me, "Thank you for your service." I almost today feel like. It's more of the the equivalent of somebody sneezing and somebody going, bless you, because they almost oh, feel like they don't should. Feel that way. Please don't I, feel that way. I, you know what it is, though? It's it's from being on the inside mm-hmm. and, and hearing it, because I also look at uh, – hopefully I've changed some minds about this one. When people say – talk about the current serving generation – and they talk oh about these kids. Gosh. Oh, they sock this, that, and the other. I always tell them, I'm like, you're missing that you're watching the, in my opinion, now this is my age, and I grew up uniquely with a World War I veteran. Mm-hmm. And I still will stand by that this generation that serves today is the greatest generation to have ever served. And here's why. And you, I, I would love for you to talk to your son about it. this is, you said it, this is the first time in planetary history, the entire planet, as far as we know, to ever have an all voluntary military service, defend their country. Oh, and then not okay. only did they, not only is it all voluntary, Charlie, it's all voluntary that you're just as of last year, starting to see the retirement Mm-hmm. Of guys that have known nothing but war That's right. for their entire service time. So yeah, that again, one of those. Th- those are two things that's never happened mm-hmm. in planetary. So when people are like these kids, I'm like, do you realize that there's some young man or some young lady serving today that has only known war, that has only known in their service time? I'm going to go to a country where people don't like me. Not, hey, you know, when I joined in 94, there wasn't shit going on. There were some things that happened, but they were mostly in like Europe and they were here and there. And, hey, we might do something and this might happen. But you could join in 94 and got out in 98 and nothing and had nothing happen during your time in the service. Mm -hmm. Really from 94 all the way up to September 11th, you could have served. And Well, there were little things that happened. But there were little things. Like I was in, I was in the Mediterranean during uh, Operation Silver Wake, which was Bosnia mm-hmm. and Albania. I got an award for it. it didn't do shit. <laughs> like it, it, like there was things like that going on. But, but I mean, but, but it's funny how you bring that up and associate that with epigenetics because really, it is. You're Morgan and I were just talking about that last night. Yeah, and now, now I, I in my mind, I think about that's environment and behavior. That's new stressors, new stresses in your life. If you if you treat it that way, which is going to affect how you how you genetically, you know, are you having stomach issues? Are you having this issue? Are you having that issue? That's you're affecting yourself genetically based on behavior and environment. Is that what you're talking about from the epigenetics piece? It is, and I don't want to oversimplify this. There's, um, and I. I totally I have a simple them. audience. I have a very simple and audience. I, <laughs> Nathan's out there I right totally now. I totally believe uh, it's in both the Old and the New Testament, Testament. As a man thinks, or as a woman thinks, so she is. And I believe there's a lot to looking at the world as progress rather than looking at the world as a dead end and just throw your hands up. 
no matter what it is. My little grandson was downstairs just a minute ago and he said, Mimi, did you know that they think that the dinosaurs were what heated up the earth and it wasn't really a comet? The dinosaurs made it so hot. And I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's a new one for you're me. Right. There was this giant comet to kind of finish it off, but they were moving that direction before the comet hit. And, you know, we were talking about that and, and he, and he kind of looked up and he said, so is that what's going to happen to us? And I said, we're not dinosaurs. You know, we, we can, we can do a little bit more. So we had this, I said, we need to talk about this later, but I'm going to run upstairs. And, <laughs> and he did say to tell all of y'all, Ura, except love that. he was actually born in the UK and over there they say, yep, yep. So just in case, because I invited some of our British military friends to join tonight. So in case y'all are on, uh, Garrett says yet yet. I, I, I got in trouble. Um, <laughs> I got in trouble for. I got in trouble one time for doing that. Yet yet. <laughs> yeah, with a sergeant major, he's like, he couldn't. I was on a phone call, and I was like, yet. He's like, who the hell said that? I was like, mm, I'm not saying shit. <laughs> That was um, that was a very special time for Morgan. He he got to deploy with the Royal Marines. And That's awesome. Yeah, he received some sort of award that I still don't know exactly what he did for it, but he is the um, the only non Royal serviceman that's ever received that. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah, I'll find out eventually what it was for. But, um, <laughs> I was actually there when he got it. I still don't know what it was for. But um, getting getting back to the epigenetics, um, I want to kind of back up. And I'm going to use animals as an, as an example, because I okay. think sometimes that's a good way to start. Uh, you, I don't know if you've ever been to a circus or somewhere where they had elephants. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have any chains or anything on them. They had a little tiny stick. And that elephant did whatever that person wanted them to do. They didn't right. run off. You know, they didn't go crazy. They just did whatever they wanted them to do. If you look closely, you probably saw a decorative band around at least one foot, maybe all four. They okay. have a decorative band there. Um, they will take a baby elephant, take it away from its mother, and they put a heavy, heavy chain around one or two feet. So the elephant really can't move. And they have the elephant doing all kinds of things. But that baby elephant's world is a little two foot square. That's the only thing they know. Oh, wow. And the only time they move or do anything is with that little tiny stick and their handler. And over time, that big, heavy chain becomes a lighter chain, a lighter chain, a little piece of thread or rope, and then finally nothing. And it's been taught that it, it believes and it doesn't even have the thought that it can move outside and away from that, that little area right there. And part of that is epigenetics. But what is really interesting is if that elephant is a female, her babies, when you put that band on it as a baby, the babies won't run off. They won't wander off. They do exactly what they're supposed to do with that little, that little um, stick. God, we all do the same thing. Learned behavior, and it has to do with pieces of their genetics. Genetically, they're strong enough to move off, but the gene that yeah. says wander off in the jungle has been the volumes turned down, and the gene that says do whatever this guy with the stick says has been turned up. And that's yeah. what epigenetics is. It's the it's laying over the genes. Another this one just really um, surprised me when I read the statistics on this. Uh, fleas are fun to start study. Fleas and flies are used a lot because their lifespans are short. They took some fleas that you, they had them in a, 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 a cup. I know this the, one. The fleas would jump out. So they put a lid on it and the fleas couldn't jump out anymore. It had lid on it. Um, they waited until they could take the lid off and none of the fleas would even try to jump. Now, fleas Even if they jumped them out. <laughs> no, they left them in there. No, but it, I, I watched that study. And if oh, they, you did? So if, even after they dump them out yeah. and dump the fleas out, they would only jump as high as what that lid was. They would so never jump higher than that. The next generation. That's the crazy. next generation would only jump that high. Um, my husband's an equine vet, and we saw this happen frequently, and it's a number of a number of studies done with racehorses. And uh, he had a mare that was in a horrible wreck in Colorado, and the the trailer was on its side and they had a hard time getting her out. And, you know, it was just a terrible, terrible experience. She was about four or five years old when they, and she flat would not get in a trailer. You had to drug her and, and practically carry her into a trailer. She was oh, wow. not getting anywhere near a trailer. She had five or six foals. Not a single one of them would go anywhere near a trailer. None of them. They had inherited that same fear of that trailer. 
and they see this frequently, a great example, and I've gone totally blank. What was the name of the, um, the horse that ran right before World War II? Um, was related, was a cousin. From a sec- secretariat? Se- uh, no. Oh, gosh. Somebody type, the, type it in. I was just looking at this earlier. Nate, go look that up for us. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, he was also a son of War Horse. And okay. he had been kind of thrown away. Um, he was um, irascible. He wouldn't um, behave. You never knew what he was going to do. He would charge at other horses on the racetrack. And as a young horse, he was amazing. He was so fast, but he was almost looked like a committee had put him together. He wasn't really a beautiful thoroughbred. He was just kind of not all there. He was a little bit small too. And they had kind of written him off. And there was a trainer that was running him in little minor races around And this trainer just really thought there was something to this horse. And the trainer was an alcoholic and kind of useless and nobody would really give him a permanent horse. Is there a movie about this? I feel like there's a movie about this. There is a movie about that. Yes. And the the trainer finally um, got him doing some winning and through a a whole series of crazy things that happened, um, found a man that was willing to invest in him. And um, he's one of the Chrysler people. And they invested in this horse. And then they also found a throwaway jockey because a legitimate jockey was like, I'm not riding that horse. It's crazy. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. So they had this group of misfits and this owner that did not really have a lot of respect in the horse world. He was from California. And at that time, anybody that was, you know, worth a darn in the horse world was in New York, you know, that area. So there was, there was nothing going for this group. But they started working with that horse, and he won, and he won, and he won, and he won. What did Sea Biscuit, right? Sea Biscuit. That's exactly what it was. Okay. Yeah. And then the jockey was thrown off, broke his leg in so many places. He never, ever, ever should have been able to walk, much less ride. A lot of people don't appreciate jockeys. They are truly the strongest athletes out there. You know that saying, take the bit in your mouth and run with it? When you – pull back on a horse's head and you've got that bit tight, you are now holding the weight of the horse's head. So now the horse can go do anything it wants to. <laughs> You're carrying the heaviest weight and it is free to go. And But that's what jockeys do. They don't even weigh as much as that head they're holding in their hands. And the, the power that they have in their torso, it's just ridiculous. And he had lost all of that in his leg and yet he came back. The horse had the same thing happen. The horse went down and it's a miracle that they didn't put the horse down at the track because they didn't have any of the technologies they have now to work with the broken leg. Both the horse and the jockey came back. And that is a true testament to epigenetics. They were in a unique situation where they had unbelievable emotional support. They had um, people that believed in them. They had insane nutrition. They had a training Um, opportunity in regimen that is hardly ever offered anywhere. There was actually nothing except their injury that was going against them. And the human body can recover from just about anything when the only, the only piece that's missing is that one physical injury. And that's one of the most beautiful testaments to how that layering of environment and behavior how all of that works to actually change what should happen. And we see it sometimes with um, situations where someone, are, are we here about when, you know, a, a mother picks up a, a car that right. her baby's under, you know, those kinds of things. And it's sort of that same kind of thing. That gene is there. It's never been called on. It can be called on again. Um, a simple, a simple explanation for this, and it doesn't sound like much, but if I ask you, to change your color from flesh colored to turquoise or (laughs) I know it would be almost impossible to do. And yet we have some plants that we do that to all the time by a simple nutritional additive. If you have a hydrangea, if you put soda ash on it, you get a blue flower. If you put an acid on it, put coffee grounds on it, you get a pink flower. The gene for blue and the gene for pink are there. It just depends which one gets the nutrition to rise to the top. That's wow. what, it, what it's about. And we saw the same thing happen with that story, that horse and that jockey. They had everything else they needed. That hydrangea has the right soil. It has the right sunlight. If they don't have the right soil and sunlight, the plant, the, the flower is going to be kind of a white color, no matter what you do for it. But if you have all those other things in place, 
the proper moisture, everything else is in place, then you can completely change the complete appearance of that, of that plant. Now, how and, did you get into epigenetics? I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm very no. curious, like how you got into this entire piece. Cause like you said, you know, you're a mom, you're raising four kids, you're, mm-hmm. you're full life, you know, doing, all, you know, you're, Every time we've talked, you're you're always doing something. Even to this day, <laughs> I know. You're, you're probably one of the busiest people I know. Get out of a car or a plane, yeah. yeah. So um, how did you even I was get into part it? At that generation of women, I wasn't a bra burner, but I was that generation that we were still told you can't do this. Um, I was nine years old in 1960, and one of the things that Robert Kennedy, I mean John Kennedy, did that directly affected my life was he decided that we were going to put a man on the moon, and Two of the things with that is kind of epigenetic-y. Um, he declared publicly that we were going to beat Russia to that, and Russia was way ahead of us. And then he poured every resource he could find into making that happen. And one of them was not being content with the scientists they had at that time. He um, put out this all call that every single student, no matter what color, poverty level, where they were, anything else, they got this science blast. And he did it from kindergarten up. And if you scored in a certain range on that, then you were kind of targeted to be a part of this national science program. And I was nine years old. And in the, at the beginning of the year, I, nobody on this call but me is going to remember weekly readers. <laughs> it was this little, little tiny newspaper for kids that came on Fridays. And there was an article in there about Jacques Cousteau. And he was, I have two son-in-laws in Big Oil. And basically they say he was a um, pimple on Big Oil. He was a tiny little pimple. On Big, <laughs> Big Oil's Oil, ass. Very large ass. And he was mainly, he wasn't even really doing anything with Big Oil at that time. He was mainly irritating the Japanese and whaling. But I come from the from Corpus. I had just found out that the Gulf has a uh, coral reef. I'd been taken out to actually illegally at nine scuba, that coral reef. And I wanted to save coral reefs. And I decided in October of 1960 that I was going to be a marine geoscientist and I was going to save coral reefs. Didn't want to save whales, didn't want to save dolphins. And there was a TV show on the time about a dolphin, which I could have cared less about. I wanted to save the coral reefs. When I told my teacher that, flipper, she, she literally patted me on the head and said, oh, darling, little girls are teachers and nurses. You can help little boys save coral reefs. And I remember looking at her and saying, no, I'm going to save coral reefs. Well, I went home and told my dad about that conversation. <laughs> and my dad went up there and talked to that teacher and said, if she wants to be, you know, <laughs> and then maybe, and she and my mom were good friends. They were actually in a story together. And then in February, we took this test in, later on in the fall. And in February, was I was identified as being one of those talented and gifted science people that could not memorize my multiplication tables. Um, they had actually a NASA scientist that would go to these school districts and gather up all these kids. And we went to this big meeting and they said, oh, you're going to be in this special program, whatever. And when they came to get me on this class, this teacher said, I think you've made a mistake. I have other students who are so much better in math or science than she is. And this um, scientist said, well, now, was this the same one that was a turd to you? Mm-hmm. Yep. And we actually share the same birthday and she's one of my mom's good friends. But at the time, she was not being ugly to me. That sometimes we forget the times that was very realistic. There were so few women going to college and that we still had teacher schools. I mean, in Texas, um, we had state a state college was for teachers, period. And it was almost all women. Texas A&M had no education whatsoever. You went to a state school to get that. I mean, and that was in 69. I mean, it was, she wasn't being ugly at all. She's being very realistic. But um, when he came to take me to this meeting and she said, I think you made a mistake. And she said, "Uh, Charlie can't even learn her, her um, multiplication tables. And he looked at her and he said, ma'am, I'm going to put a man on the moon and I can't balance my checkbook. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, I'm so good with that <laughs> and I was just like I'm ready and we kind of were in this, this this special little group and we were um we got some special things we had some regular things when we got to high school is when it really showed up they didn't really have a lot of the pre-AP and um right for credit classes but when we when this group of us graduated from high school 
we basically had at least three and maybe four semesters done. We had people that would come into our school and, and teach us a college class and then we would move on. And we had to go to the universities and uh, take special tests and do all wow. sorts of things like that. But it was a very different time. So I had this. And the other thing is, well, we had no air conditioning in Corpus at that time in the high schools or anything. We could, women could not wear pants. We, we couldn't even wear pantsuits. In 1970, after I'd graduated in fall of 70, my sister could wear pantsuits, but we couldn't wear pants. Um, my class uh, in 68, they had decided that we were challenging a lot of things. And of course we're surfer dudes. I mean, you know, surfing the whole bit, whole beach thing, about half of us, I think were lifeguards. And the boys all decided that their hair was going to touch their collar. Some of it was below their collar. Now you couldn't wear t-shirts. Boys had to wear button down shirts and slacks and you couldn't wear sandals. Everybody had to wear socks. I mean, it was, you know, and this was in 1969, this wasn't in the fifties. And actually my dad would let, not let us go out with boys who weren't wearing socks. <laughs> he would literally check. I'm not sure what the sock thing was, but it was really important to those guys. I, I don't like to not. Look, I, I don't know. like to not. I'm wearing socks right now. I don't have to. I'm <laughs> in my house. Like, I don't like to not wear socks. And oh. I, you know, what drives me nuts is my kids do the socks that don't match. Yeah, and, that's and I'm like, right I'm like, I'm like, will you, will you? I bought matching socks. What's it matter, Dad? They're just socks. I'm like, oh, it was, it was this culture of. We had the entire class was out on the steps for this high school, and then it kind of spread to the other high schools. And so the school board met very quickly and said, okay, the boys' hair can touch their collars, but it can't be any longer than that. Now, girls were still, still stuck in, you know, dresses and things, but it, it was that kind of environment that was just beginning. I was a part of that. And like I said the bra burning was already happening. Um, Chicago trial happened then. There were so many things that were happening at that time. Um and we were all a part of that. So we had kind of this push that envelope mentality was coming on. My um, daughter-in-law was trying to reach my grandson. Um, so we had this kind of mentality that was coming on at that time. And that was like a major win. You would have thought we'd won the war and girls were in blue jeans and, you know, boys had hair down to their shoulders. I mean, it was just such a huge win for us. So having that kind of an attitude and taking that forward into challenging any any number of things. And I was at AM as a group of 100 women. There were other women there. They were children of professors and things like that. But we were 100 freshmen women that were there. And there were so many different, um, different barriers that we pushed. And it just created, and, and we won, one after one after one. So I had this environment, much like Seabiscuit. I kept winning. I kept winning. <laughs> I kept winning. I kept winning. And I was charming and I was cute. I also had shoulders out to here and AM's football team was terrible. And they kept telling me I should be a defensive lineman. Wait a second. So, A&M's football? A&M's got a hell of a program. They were awful. We lost to TCU and Rice that year. But oh, um, wow. yeah, it was crazy. But it was, uh, we just kept winning. Yeah, we kept winning these small battles. And then I ended up not, I actually had a Fulbright fellowship and I had a job mm -hmm. waiting for me with, um, with uh, with the, the whole marine science thing. And they had completely switched around by that time. And they were working with oil companies because they said the oil rigs in the gulfs and the season things were going to actually save coral reefs. They were going to create a new environment for the coral reefs. Once again, epigenetics is coming back up there again. You know, you create, the, create this environment and species flourish whether it's a coral or a horse or a flea or a human being, you create the correct environment and it flourishes. And that's what I was seeing happen. And in fall of 69, I was sitting in a genetics class and they started talking about epigenetics and they were using it with, um, with horses primarily and uh, some training. And they were seeing huge advances in um, like when you, when you taught a race horse or a cutting horse, um, they say that cutting is genetic, but actually what it is is it's epigenetic. When you train this cutter, particularly a mare, when you train her and she's an amazing cutter, her offspring are going to naturally herd people, ducks, chickens. I mean, they just nat naturally cut them. And you see oh. the same thing in dogs. You'll see the herding dogs. You know, they'll herd anything. And 
it's they say it's genetics, but it's actually the epigenetics. There's really not a gene for hurting. There's a gene for a good nose. There is a gene for a height where you don't, you know, corgis and uh, healers are short so that when a cow or a horse kicks, it goes over their head. It doesn't smack them in the face. So there's things like that. But that um, that that next piece is the epigenetics. Huh. And we see it so many times in animals and they were talking about this. And another interesting thing about epigenetics is when Watson and Crick, the two scientists in the 30s, 20s, that won the Nobel Prize for the DNA ladder structure, and it just opened up the world to genes and chromosomes and all those other things. They actually debated for a while because a bunch of other scientists and universities and things had come up with that ladder structure. It was basically who's going to get published first. It was a race to publish, not actually a race for the science. They actually debated whether to let that go and function on epigenetics which they'd already seen. Really? At, yes. And, and I'm not going to get into that part of the science of it, but I think you probably saw some of that and it's um, very well explained now. There's a lot of people that explain that better, but um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Except it's exactly the same in sled dogs. It is. That's you're exactly right. Yeah, Nate says sled dogs. It's the same thing. They all want, want Togo's bloodline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Nathan, they actually have some sled dogs now. Uh, with a group that's up there at Denali that uh, they're using pointers and th there goes the whole really? thing you have to have long thick hair pointers have insane metabolism yes. you know they're just crazy insane and they're they're really strong for their size but but yeah it's that same that same kind of thing so when we start looking at again moving it back to people there's a very famous study that was some of the documents that I sent you that was in there that you may have found uh, done in LA and it was with teachers they had these teachers in inner city LA and they told them that they told each one of these uh, teachers that they were, they had pulled the best of the best of that school. And their class was all the, the kids that had the ability to do, do anything, go farther. They had everything that was needed to succeed as opposed to what you know. And I taught inner city as to what you normally see in inner city, no support at home, um, you know, poor diet, uh, no resources, and that that's what a child needs to succeed. They've got to have a parent that reads to them at night, you know, all those kind of things. And these were seven and eight year old children. And they told these teachers, these are the kids you have. You have the kids that are not in that mold. You have the kids that have everything going for them. They didn't. They had random kids. But these teachers believe they had these incredible kids. They changed the way they taught. They changed what they did in their classroom. They changed the way they treated the kids, what their expectations were the kids. Those kids grew two, three and four grade levels in one year. That's because wild. of the teacher's attitude. And that's what happened with this group of people that John Kennedy pulled out and said, go forth and do wonderful things. You've been targeted as this really special learner. And look at all the things that have come out of that. Oh, sure. All the insane things that have come out of this group of people that were born. That group was really born between 44 and 56, 57. They extend the baby boomers into the 60s, but that was really the group that they were targeting for that. That's the other wild. thing that John Kennedy did that is amazing, he changed the uh, veterans benefits so that women got the all the veterans benefits, going to school, the loans, all those kind of things. And I was actually looking at, I didn't think I could get a scholarship or anything like that. So I was actually looking at going into the Navy. And um, so he, so I kind of relaxed about how I was going to college. I was kind of like, oh, no worries. I'm going into the Navy. I get to travel the world. No problem. And um, and then the whole thing about having a swim scholarship came up, but uh, he directly affected my life because I was really at nine and ten worrying about how I was going to go to college because Dad said I will help you do anything you can, but there's no way I can pay for college. And nobody did back then. Nobody was paying for college back then in the sixties. Listen to me, Charlie. But it took the pressure off when I realized, oh, I looked at being an airline stewardess, but there's no way because somebody would have asked me to you know do their seat buckle, and I would have said I ain't touching that. <laughs> so. <laughs> That was not going to work. Well, well you, yeah. you, I mean, listen, Charlie, you're 71 years old and you're still a beautiful woman. I can only imagine <laughs> when, what you looked like back in those days. And, and you know, you'd, you'd have fit the, uh, the TWA mold. There's little, little doubt in my mind. You'd have fit yeah, that. I, was, TWA I did mold. not have anything else to do that. It was really kind of funny. I lasted about 30 minutes in the interview, but, um, and thank you for the compliments. I really appreciate it. I, I got to throw this out to you. Now, now Ray Gagnon is 
to me is Master Guns Gagnon. Yes. And love exactly Master Guns. Right. And exactly. he says, what the mind conceives, and mm-hmm. he capitalizes all these, believes the body will achieve. The key is to believe. Absolutely. Um, I mean, gosh, that's that's Marine Corps boot camp in a, in a nutshell. Is. That's the other thing. I was just talking to Morgan, and y'all will love this. You think? Yes, I do. I agree. College means more when you can pay, pay for it. All Absolutely. Of our kids school. They had to pay for half of it, and we didn't pay for C's. But if we were me, writing that check, it was A's and B's. Charlie, I have told all my children, and you can I, I grab any one of them that's mm-hmm. a, of speaking age. They know the rules are simple. When you graduate from high school, you have one of two two paths, and that's C bag or <laughs> Samsonite. I will not pay for college. You're not putting me into debt. I got my own debt. So you can either go to college and, and, and do your thing. It's on you. Or I will take you to the recruiter's office. And trust me, I recruited for 12 years in the Marine Corps. I know the rules. I know the game. I will make sure you get the right program and you go and do what you want to do. As long as you don't smile and your heart slows down, I will take care of you. But I won't pay for it. But, but I'm curious of something here, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, and I know you got the grandkids you got to go chase here sh- shortly. Doing fine. Yeah. Okay, good. So so let's fast forward a little bit. Tell me about what you're doing today with epigenetics. Uh, my goal is to be the epigenetics influencer on social media and face-to-face. That's where I want to be because I think this is so important, and it goes back to what Ray was just talking about, um, having that belief and it was like once I had the belief that I was going to school with, with the Navy, I was going, everything started falling into place. And it, it wasn't things I could have predicted or made happen or anything else. I mean, it was things that just started falling into place. I had a true, real face-to-face connection with Cousteau, not the famous Cousteau, but with the company. Oh. They ended up coming to Port Aransas, Texas to do the first turtle thing. And I was part of this marine science class and he needed a bunch of kids that knew the layout of the sandbars and the waves and all that stuff. Well, I was a lifeguard and a surf babe. I the huge person right here. I've got that locked in. Well, when they found out what I wanted to do, they said, oh, we want you to go to school, get this degree, come to France. We're going to teach you everything you need to know. And then you will be our girl in the Gulf. I'm like, done. So I had this just happen, but I wasn't worried anymore about how I was going to go to school. And Ray, I think that's a real strong piece of that belief is belief is, I think, a part of prayer, whoever you want to pray to, your gunny or God, whichever. Takes <laughs> it. But um, when you can't pray and worry. So when you take that worry out of it and you're just praying, then things just start happening for you. And that's really, you know, the way it was. And you see, my son and I were just talking about um, boot camp and uh, Marine officers are unique in that they have to go to TBS and they are taken down to the nuts and bolts when they're at TBS. I mean, Morgan was, whoa. (laughs) For those who don't know what TBS stands for, that's the basic school. And and yes, and he was a cocky little, you know what, until... The gunny's got a hold of him at basic school. And yeah, he, they go to OCS he, officer candidate school, then TBS, the basic yes. school, which is six months of training after the first three months of training. Right. And it's what truly makes a Marine officer, Marine officer. I have to tell this story. I have my son and two nephews who are actually Marine Corps officers. And uh, the other one's a cover pilot as well. And he was on an MEU. And this goes back to what I wanted to say about boot camp and about um, OCS and TBS. You know, Marine officers live for their Marines. They will lay down their lives. They will do everything there is. And they call them my Marines. They will do everything there is. And I can story after story after story, you know, about things that they did that um, in, in Iraq, one of my son's classmates was a corpsman. And he told, Mor- he told me to tell Morgan, or he told his mother to tell me, that when the other um, services were providing the air cover for the really long transport um I guess they call them trains to get supplies and stuff in. Mm -hmm. And once the first couple of trucks got through the gate, they left. Well, all the bad guys came out from everywhere. And he said when it was the Marines, they didn't pull away until the last truck drove through the gate. 
And he said there was one time he was going into some base or something and they were being all shot up and he was running down this line trying to save somebody. And he was just, gee, damn it, why can't that be Morgan up there? You know, that kind of thing. And it's that, and my son was not that kind of kid. I mean, we were convinced that, you know, he was going to ha- kind of have to struggle because he kind of thought that he could be charming and adorable and life would happen <laughs> to him. And we kept saying, no, sooner or later, the rubber meets the road. And he was like, yeah, right. And then the Marines got a hold of him. And his recruiter at AM will tell you, I was the toughest nut he ever had to crack. And Morgan will tell you the hardest battle he ever fought was me. I just did not want him in the military at all, much less the Marine Corps. Really? I'm very oh, surprised to hear that. After, it was after 9-11. And there was so much... Um, misinformation probably, but yeah, I was the worst out there. I was See, I think you bleed Blue Star Mom. I just feel like you bleed Blue Star Mom. <laughs> I'm not even in the Blue Star Moms, actually. Well, you, you're not in, but you are. I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I work with a lot of veterans groups. I don't have to bleed that to me. When I work with. But the what happens, we we're talking about in, in boot camp, you take all these kids, like you saw, and, and recruiting, you saw them, and they were, the words that I've heard before is you strip them down. You really don't. You really start over and you give them a whole different belief system. And what I was asking Morgan about it, and he said, well, you start with a small group and then you make a bigger group and a bigger group and a bigger group. And it's more than just doing what you're told. It's what is best for the group, which is the highest form of service. And you're not, you're not going to sacrifice yourself unnecessarily you're going to take good care of yourself. You're going to put yourself first, but you're also going to give your life if you, it's needed. And there's a difference in, I hope I'm making sense, in putting yourself when you're making decisions about moving forward and these kind of things and being willing to give your life for another person in war. And it's, it's, that's what happens there. And, and that is, that is epigenetics. And um, there's so many, great uh, warriors and leaders that Alexander the Great was the first one that completely changed the training for his soldiers. Napoleon did the same thing. They did the same thing after World War I. With World War II, the interesting story, there are a couple of epigenetics books out there on military, but they had this group. It was the most educated group of people they'd ever had that were trained for service in World War II. Now, it still might have been eighth grade, but for World War One, the majority had not finished third grade and over half of the people serving could neither read nor write. Oh, wow. That was not true for World War Two. You've got a different group of people. That other training is not going to work. And now then with this group, he was and actually with with your class. What did you guys do starting in oh, 83, 84? You're playing games all the time, right? Yeah. I was teaching science. People were cursing those games. And I was like, no, these are the greatest problem solvers ever. Have you actually played Mario Brothers? <laughs> I mean, and then I would have students who said, I'm so sorry, I can't memorize a periodic table. And I'd say, what level are you in Mario Brothers? You can memorize anything. <laughs> you know, they yeah, lost yeah those things, it, it's definitely, it's it's funny you bring that up about the, the education piece. That's a, it, Morgan and I, could do an entire show just on mm-hmm. how that's that's changed because I, I just had this conversation where somebody was like some general just recently came out and said, Oh, we're going to have to go back to a draft. You know, we, we're, we're running low on people in the services. It was a Marine general. And, and I had to educate everyone. The Marine that I enlisted in 2001, mm-hmm. that Ray Gagnon, master guns yes. was one of my instructors. He he's master guns. Gagnon is one of the, most well educated. Morgan went in in two thousand three. Okay, so I, I could have recruited more. I could have recruited Morgan. You could have just put. But you put have it that remembered way. me. <laughs> God, make me feel old. I could have recruited Morgan, but so. But what I I just recently had this conversation. It's funny with epigenetics, how you know environment and everything. Um, that kid that today is starting to retire is leading kids that he couldn't have enlisted with because they've changed the parameters so much and become so strict on what they're looking for and what they need out of each branch of the service. But it's interesting as you're, you're educating us on epigenetics um, that I even saw that in now that you're kind of giving it another light, I saw that in schools. 
-hmm. I would go into a school that maybe had one or two kids that had ever enlisted or had enlisted. Um, but the right kid changed the mindsets and the behavior of everyone around them who said, well, now I want to do that. Now I need to go do that. Now I want to go do that. And it really does, does change that. Um, we're, I, I don't want to keep you for, do you have time? You and we're, I do. We, I wanted to, to come back to the gaming yes, and please. the environment and the, the, if you, um, I was, I was a science teacher for forever. I was an early adopter of technology because particularly with science, you know, we have to keep science books for years and all, all my students ever did with science books was highlight what was wrong in them. Okay. <laughs> by the time you got ready to adopt it is the entire book. So I saw technology as, Oh my gosh, we can keep up here. And uh, we did some really crazy things. I had a group of landlocked students in Arlington, Texas, who won the International Coral Reef Project in 1999. Oh, wow. Landlocked. 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 And they won it. And they came up with incredible things. And they did such a great job. They were nominated for a Smithsonian Laureate. These 13-year-old wow. kids. And they won it. And if you go to the Smithsonian, the American Smithsonian, and ask to see the Coral Reef Project, it's the most popular program because it's interactive. You can actually play a game and kill a reef or save a reef. You get to choose. And it's, it's the coolest thing ever. And these kids came up with it with this primitive Mario. Well, it was primitive in, when was that, 99? Because gaming had gone so far by then. Oh, yes. But the game that I had that was free that I could offer my students looked like Mario Brothers. <laughs> and that's what they did. But those, those kids... They, and so they said, well, you come teach other teachers how to do what you do. And we had this program called Marco Polo. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. A teacher, because we were really worried about kids on the Internet getting somewhere they shouldn't be. Cell phones were, this was in 2008 or 9. We didn't have um, the uh, iPhone yet. But cell phones were becoming more and more common. You couldn't really get on the Internet. But, you know, we we're having to wrestle with texting and whatever. So they were worried about kids getting somewhere that they shouldn't get. So with Marco Polo, a teacher's doing a project on George Washington and they can go like seven or eight layers deep with websites. And so kids would have maybe a hundred websites they could choose from that, to do their report on George Washington. And we were so proud of that. And I was at this big state meeting, teachers, teachers how to do that. And I was so proud of it. And um, we had this kid who was the technology director for Houston. He looked like he was about 12 and he had been in that class and he was, asking me questions, looking at it. Oh yeah, this is, he didn't really say much about it. When he gave his talk to the group at whole, that was principals, directors, state curriculum people, district curriculum people. And he said, um, talked about the Marco Polo and he pulled out a cell phone and he said, meanwhile, in their pockets, they have access to every shred of knowledge in the entire world. And you're asking them to stay with this. And I was like, Oh my gosh, he's right. This is nuts. Well, my son was saying, and he was, I told him he's acting like an old man. He needed to clean his act up about a year ago. These <laughs> kids today, they don't want to do this. They don't want to dress right. They're sloppy with their shirts. I'm like, oh, please. Oh, <laughs> you know, get a grip. But it is important. And he has cleaned up this group for sure. And they adore him. But he was saying this group, it's like that. He said, if you, if, if you were asked when you were 18, who did you most respect? It was probably your dad a Boy Scout leader, a pastor, something like that. If you ask these kids today who they most respect, they have to think a minute. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, and they have so much access to stuff. So you can look at that as a negative thing or you can look at it and building on it. It goes back to the gaming. That is the way you think for that. Oh, my gosh. It's a whole different way of thinking, of looking at problem solving. When you think about gaming and you're a product of that. The way you look at what you're doing today. Oh, you yeah. Go back and thank Pac-Man for that. I mean, it's a whole <laughs> different way of thinking. And the, the, you know, how much have we saved? How much money, how much in the environment have we saved with simulators? I mean, when, what's that? It's a game. Uh, they thought that Morgan might be ADD, ADHD. I just said he's just misbehaving and making behavior. <laughs> no, this isn't happening. No, we're not doing drugs. But when he first told me what he's going to be flying a Cobra and I said, Oh my gosh, maybe you really are ADD. It takes somebody ADD to fly a helicopter. I, I like, worked on those yes, things. I can do 10 different things at once. I, I worked on those. It used Which to be so interesting. You know. Oh yeah. Well, uh, that was with yeah. the only aircraft that when you clicked off the autopilot, 
you have to you have to be able to work your feet and then make small figure eights the entire time to stabilize a helicopter. Yes. People don't understand that. They watch these shows and they're like, oh, it's a fly helicopter. No, no. I don't think I, I can promise you. see the new Top Gun because I've had friends tell me, oh, no, you don't want to see that. <laughs> I, I, ha I've, I haven't seen the new one yet. So, Morgan, but now, he loved it. so he told me to go see it anyway. He said, just ignore all the technical it's stuff. Fun. It's, 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 it's fun. It's look. I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched Marine Corps movies or other stuff like that when I'm like, there is nothing about this that is accurate. I'll accept it for the fun that it is, yeah. and then I'm moving on. So now you've well, also got some I, epigenetic I, I what I do and where my part fits in there for me personally. First, I want people to understand that when you were talking about weight and how hard it is, um, there's a lot of things you need to do for that belief um, to make that belief happen. Um, you can't have to, um, you can't have that belief and not take action on it and not take action to nurture it. You have to be around people that support that belief. You can't be around negative people. You can't be around negative things. You have to be sure that uh, you're in a situation where you're going to be lifted up and or you remove yourself from a situation where you're not. And it's a, the same thing that's true about weight. We have a horrific inflammation issue in this country that we see it as weight, but sometimes you can be skinny fat and be just outnumbered in, inflammatorily. Uh, part of it is sleep, but you don't have to get eight hours of sleep all at one time. You can spread that out. It's just as valuable if you spread it out. It's kind of like exercise. You don't have to get it all at one time. You can do these I'm gonna little naps. I'm going to tell my boss that. I'm going to tell you my boss You can get these that. little naps. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. But we have this battle going on between uh, cortisol and insulin. And you're eating a whole lot of sugar and sugar doesn't really do a lot for you. So you wear out and then your body's making all sorts of insulin to counteract the sugar, but you're starting to wear out because the sugar really doesn't do much for you. You really need protein and all the minerals and micronutrients that are in vegetables, but you're not getting that. So now you're going to go get more sugar and more and it. So you just have this battle. And if you're working out a whole lot, your body makes even more cortisol because you're working out. So we have, and then you're going to get more sugar. Everybody drinks Gatorade, right? Go work out really hard and then have Gatorade, sugar and cortisol battling like this. So there are some, some things that you can do. And there are some epigenetic nutritional products that are out there now that, and, and I market the best, of course, that will actually help that battle start warming down and cooling off. And, it actually changes the environment primarily in your gut so that you're not going to be wanting all that sugar all the time. And you're not going to be producing all that insulin and you're not going to have all the cortisol going on. And you're going to see a little bit of weight loss. Well, when you have a little bit of weight loss, what do you do? You go for a you walk. More. Yeah. You grab a carrot. Yeah. It's that whole thing about what happened with Seabiscuit. <laughs> Seabiscuit had these people who finally said, oh, you don't want to run like that. Um, one of the little tricks that was actually really true was they would put Seabiscuit, they had to get him up where he could look another horse in the eye and he would take off. Well, somebody figured that out. Just oh, let no him shit. look him in the eye. And that was really true. Guess what? Seabiscuit's babies were the same dang way. Let them look him in the eye and off they go. Who knows what that triggered in his eyes? Look at that. You but, got another uh, customer already. Nate's already yeah, ready to sign right. up. But the, the nutritional piece to that and just some li little lifestyle changes, that's my role. Not just selling products, but, and I'm going to share with y'all, I call it, call this the cascading waterfall of wonderfulness. Now I'm a runner. Asking me to walk is, it's just really hard, but I do. I walk 20 minutes a day. I walk fast enough that I'm, I'm breathing a little bit hard. I can still talk, but I can't sing. I do that for 20 minutes in some kind of sunshine. Now, living in Texas, I'm not going to do that at 11. I've already destroyed my skin surfing my entire <laughs> from 9 to 20. You know, it's just shot. So I don't need to do anything else. I've avoided cancer. I intend to keep avoiding that. So I don't go at 11 o'clock. But early morning, evening, you need sunshine. It on shows, your skin. Nate. You can, <laughs> you're allergic to running, Nathan. Nate, so look, you ain't about Nate. Now. Nate, it shows it's that Nate's allergic to running. Eating waterfall of wonderfulness. When you, um, when you do this 20 minute walk, and so it takes about 30 minutes, warm up, cool down. When you do this 20 minute walk in the sunshine, you can take all the vitamin D you want, but if you don't get a little sunshine activating, 
not going to happen. So you have a little bit of the sunshine, your body's doing this whole vitamin D thing. And vitamin D is so important to so many things. Pretty much everything you've got has to do with vitamin Nate's D. Nate's a big vitamin D vitamin guy. D. He, he's always talking about the, the D and the vitamin and everything. And I am going to always... have to wrap up. I now have the Marine colony. But when oh, you, God. when you walk, um, and walking, not running, because when you run, you're slightly forward. You want to be straight up and down walking. You're putting all this weight on your back and your shoulders, your hips, your knees, your feet, and all the little tiny things that are a part of that. All those little tiny things. So you're working on little tiny tendons, little tiny ligaments, um, and strengthening everything. Like your knee you're talking about. This will actually help heal your knee. I have something else that will help you too, a collagen product that will help. But when you do all those little things and you're working on your back and what happens as we age, we start doing this. So you're working on strengthening your back and your shoulders and opening up your chest. All of these things happen when you're just walking. The other thing that happens is your body says, wait a minute, what all's going on here? We need to start making some more red blood cells. Well, red blood cells get oxygen going everywhere it needs to go. So, and it takes time for red blood cells, about six weeks, but you start getting all this oxygen. Once the body has more oxygen, you're a more clear thinker. You have more clarity. Your heart's working better. Your liver is clear and everything. Everything starts working better just from a 20 minute walk and a little bit of sunshine. So take that with you. And I do have a number of products that will help kickstart these steps. Be, be positive, surround yourself with people who are positive. And the other piece of belief is have something to believe in. Have something that will really hold you tight and strong and keep you on a course. And surround yourself with people that lift you up, wanna make you feel good. Believe, think that you're just the greatest thing since peanut butter. I love it. So if anybody wanted to find you, uh, Charlie, where could they find you at? The best place right now is um, at Charlie Hagen on Facebook. Just and, at Char and Hagen is H-A-G-A-N and Charlie's with is C H R L E E. C H A R L E. Yeah, C H A R L E E. Yes. That's the best place. And then I think you, I have an email, but it's getting ready to change. So I'll be checking that for a while, but it's getting ready to she change. She has a LinkedIn. LinkedIn is Charlie Hagen. LinkedIn. Yes. And I'm rebranding myself. I'm so proud of this. It's going to be charliehagen.com. There's nobody there yet. And my email is going to be charlie at charliehagen.com. That will be happening in the next two to three weeks. And she can also teach you how to make a wicked cocktail. She's already sent me. I can. That's right. She she well, I'm watching this gorgeous sunset. I have a so, Marine who's now sending me hate texts. <laughs> so <laughs> let, let's go ahead and get this. You got to give me one minute when this is all over with. So Absolutely. give me a minute here. Uh, as always, folks, you can find us at on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, TikTok. It's all the Above the Bar podcast. Make sure you go find us. Make sure you go look for Charlie Hagen. That's C-H-A-R-L-E-E-H-A-G-A-N on LinkedIn, on Facebook. She can tell you all about epigenetics, some of the products she has that can help you in your epigenetics. It just educates you. It's, it's mm -hmm. such a fascinating science to me. Charlie, now, again, don't log off on me. I need one minute of your time or I can shoot you a text if, I really, if you need me to. But we have one thing on this show that we always do. The guest always gets the last word. So what's the last word for tonight? Oh, let's see. Make this the best day of your life. All righty, folks. Be sure to push your stool in. This has been an Earplug Podcast presentation. Found on EarplugPodcast.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, and wherever your favorite podcasts are found.